On July 16, 1923, I moved into Exum Priory after the last workman finished his labors. I had not been a day in Anchester before I knew I came of an accursed house. And this week, workmen have blown up Exum Priory and are busy obliterating the traces of its foundations. The Rats in the Walls From the classic story by H.P. Lovecraft Adapted by Julie Hoverson Featuring Julie Hoverson as Mrs. Delapore Will Watt as Captain Norris John Lingard as Sir William Brinton And Danner Hoverson as Alfred Delapore Dearest Mumsy I laugh to hear how easily such Britishisms roll out of my pen after such a short time on this side of the pond. Sherman said that war is hell, but if it is, then waiting must be the worst hell of all. For waiting is the bulk of what we do, and it is hell. I miss you, ever so. Delapore? Hello, uh... Delapore, as the sign says? <laughs> Thank you. No. Captain Norris? Yes, Mum. Aha. You must be old Alfie's mother. So pleased to finally meet you. That is, I should say it's, it's terribly tragic and all. But I expect at the end there it was a mercy. No one wants to go out like that. Thank you. Please don't think I'm not a serious type, Mum. I, I just... I expect I did my grieving for old Alf when I last saw him, and, well, I'm sure it must be much fresher for you. Of course. Let me take your cases. No, I say. I'll keep the carrier, but you may take this one and perhaps fetch a boy for those. Oh, um, I can manage them all, never fear. Fine-looking fellow you have in the case there. Good mouser? When he can be bothered. I fear my bold and blackie is a spoiled fellow. Aren't you, you beast? Bolton? Massachusetts, where we... I... lived. Ah, ah. My motor car is right over here. I bought Exum Priory in 1918, but was almost immediately distracted from my plans of restoration by my son's return from the Great War as a maimed invalid. During the time he lived, I thought of nothing but his care. Now, bereaved and aimless, well past middle age, I resolved to divert my remaining years with my new possession. How you, my most unsentimental and practical mother, would laugh. When the local folk discovered I was descended from the nearby Scourge, they stopped speaking to me altogether. Though a few judicious rounds at the pub convinced them that I was wholly ignorant of any wrongdoing, and they regaled me with the wildest flights of fantasy I have ever heard. Dark with the moon come, and the folk would vanish. Them as didn't know how to protect themselves. Them ears as weren't wrong, ye see, man. They would open vanish sharp, and someone more dark would Alice step up. Whales, whales and howlings in the valley below the castle. Wanted it were, they say, by all them killed and vanished there. A legion of butt-winged devils used to keep witches' Sabbath each night at the Priory. Them devils was why they had gardens full of coarse vegetables up there. A nun, no matter how famous they might be, would ever dare touch. Old Sir John Cleave's horse trod on something pale and flabby and squealing in a nearby field one night. My own family goes back to the very servant that went quite mad from when he saw the grey tall. In the blessed light of day. How much did Alfred tell you? Tell me? About the Priory. Oh, I know there wasn't much left to it. Bare stone walls, towers. Just as well. It gives me something to... lavish my remaining time and money on. You have my deepest sympathy... No better cure for grief than a good day's work. How goes the reconstruction? By my reckoning, the house should be nearly livable by now. Oh, well... 
I have been on board a ship and a train and now in your motor car. And all I want is my own home and a bed that does not move. Is there a problem, Captain Norris? The materials arrived in good time, but we've had a spot of bother with the workmen. Good gad, not strikes, I hope. It's all this reading for the lower classes. Give some ideas. No, no, nothing of the sort. The locals simply refuse. Refuse? No one from the area will work at Exxon Priory, so we've had to bring in outside labour at a bit of extra cost. If it must be done, it must be done. Do these yokels give some reason why they will not accept good Yankee dollars? Surely Alfred mentioned something in his letters about the Priory's troubled past. That poppycock about the place's evil history? Poppycock or not, the locals do not forget, and they resent, rather, that you've come to restore a symbol so abhorrent to them, for, rationally or not, they view Exum Priory as nothing less than a haunt of fiends and werewolves. They're terrified. And you, young man, aren't you terrified? I've been at war, ma'am. Had all the terrified knocked clean out of me. My first American forebear had come to the colonies under some strange cloud. But no tradition was handed down except what may have been recorded in a sealed envelope, left before the Civil War by every squire to his eldest son for posthumous opening. Saw a bit of action yesterday. Flew a test recce, that's reconnaissance to you civilians, mother, over some water, all they will allow me to say. You can't imagine what it's like in the air. There are so many things to keep a close eye on that it's almost like you're not flying at all. Then comes that one moment when you can just feel everything is right. You hang in the air and time stands still. Maybe that Darwin fellow had something, but it's birds and not apes we all came from. I appreciate your willingness to have me in for tea. I'll think nothing of it. Perfectly thrilled to have you. I've been quite looking forward to getting out for a look at Exum. Ah, yes. The Priory. Yes. I hope you will forgive my bluntness, ladies, but Captain Norris seemed to be under the impression that if there was any history to be had in this town, you two ladies would be the ones to ask. <laughs> well... We have had some time to gather up our acorns, so to speak, haven't we, Laura? Oh, certainly, Eugenie. Good works can only keep one busy for so long. So I thought of turning to genealogy as a most respectable pastime. No, I fear, if I may also be blunt, when it comes to the ancient line of De La Paws, or rather De La Paw, as they were originally called, there might not be much respectability to be had. Not like that nice young Captain Norris. He's such a charmer. Oh, he's hardly outgrown his puppy fat. Eating well. Making up for the deprivations of wartime, I expect. And the Delapores? That? Well, it's all a bit of a horror story, isn't it? Oh, I'm quite in the dark. We Americans, you know, tend to forget where we came from. I've heard that. It's rather tragic. So much nicer living where your family has lived for simply ever, and knowing everything there is to know about where you came from. Yes, well, when I was a child, my family home was destroyed. Not much choice for us. How did it happen? No. American Civil War. I can recall that fire today as I saw it then, with the federal soldiers shouting, the women screaming, and the Negroes howling and praying. An entire life just gone. I was a tiny child, but no doubt you can do the math and figure out how old I am. Old enough to no longer care. <laughs> oh, oh, you're so brave. <laughs> I'm quite younger than you, and I still would never dare admit my age. Of course. And yet, youthful as you are, you still know a great deal about the area. Simply everything. Everything that anyone ever knew, anyway. Everything important. And if we don't know it, we know who to ask. How exciting for you. Can you enlighten me about Exxon Priory, then? 
the horror story? There are a few mysteries yet, there. Some stones are better left unturned, so they say. Not gardeners. Oh, how true! <laughs> well, the de la Poire family were perfectly well respected, right up until they were granted the priory by Henry the Third in 1261. Before that, there was some dreadful monastic order there. Some say they were involved in the dark arts. Certainly the Danes must have thought so. They raided absolutely everyone else up and down the coast, but never Exxon Priory, though, of course, it wasn't called that at the time. So the family moved in, and within a generation... Two, certainly. Two? Hmm. Regardless, within a very short time, they were being tarred with the same brush. Dark arts. A curse of God. And then, sometime around 1600, Walter de la Poire, a third son, murdered the entire family and fled. Not that that was unusual at the time. Murdering or fleeing? Either, but not generally both. More often than not, a successful murderer found someone else to blame and then took the title. If he should happen to be a nobleman, that is. It seems this young man was haunted by what he had done, and who could blame him? Killed his own father, sisters, brothers, servants, simply everyone. Mm, quite Shakespearean. Oh, I <gasps> suppose so. Oh, we have always held that Shakespeare is rather sordid. Don't let me forget, I must tell you the epic of the rats. It's far too extensive to put down on these measly pages I have to hand. And I shouldn't want anyone looking over the mail packet thinking I'm unfit for duty over a silly local legend. But I can tell you, it's tops. I fear this room is at the root of a lot of the rumors you've been hearing. Are you certain you want to take a look? <laughs> As if I should be able to sleep, knowing there's something in the sub-basement fit to scare children and rustics. Well... Curiosity alone would keep me from ever closing my eyes. Come along. Let me go in first with the lamp. Now, while the locals have been quite petrified, the antiquarians have been nothing but enthusiastic about your restoration of the house. Education does wonders for broadening the mind. Sir William Brinton himself has been here on a number of occasions, and by now has probably photographed every inch of this room. What are all these slabs, then? Crypts? Um, no. They're assumed to be pagan altars. It was some sort of temple. A place of sacrifice, at the very least. What the devil was wrong with people? What sort of solace could a cult offer that regular religion can't? Perhaps the cult promised them something. Something they couldn't get any other way. Sir William Brinton has probably written something on the subject. Few doubt but that indescribable rites were celebrated on the site for many centuries before even the coming of the Romans. And there were unpleasant tales of the transference of these rites into the Sibylle worship they brought, though her cult was forbidden to Roman citizens. These myths were unpleasantly reminiscent of the one known scandal of my immediate forebears. The case of a distant cousin, young Randolph Delapore of Carfax, who after he returned from the Mexican War went among the plantation's Negroes and became a voodoo priest. Anchester had been the camp of the Third Augustan Legion, as many remains attest, and it was said that the Temple of Sibylle was splendid and thronged with worshippers who performed nameless ceremonies at the bidding of a Phrygian priest. The fireside tales I was hearing represented my ancestors as a race of hereditary demons, beside whom Gilles de Ray and the Marquis de Sade would seem the various tyros. Local law insisted that the fall of the old religion did not end the orgies of the temple, but the priests lived on in the new faith without real change. 
making it the center of a cult feared through half the heptarchy. Temperament rather than ancestry was evidently the basis of the family's inner cult, for it was entered by several who married into the family. Lady Margaret Trevor from Cornwall, wife of Godfrey, the second son of the fifth baron, became a favorite bane of children and the demon heroine of a particularly horrid children's song. Phantoms and ghosties and long-legged beasties. I do not fear figments. Particularly not tonight. Our first night home. I wonder if they installed that creak with the door. Quite in keeping with all the lovely medieval fittings, eh, Blackie? But snug as a bug with the tapestries to keep out the cold. Uh, get over here, you ungrateful beast. We're home, Alfred. Dear Mother, Norris took me out to the Priory, and he's right. It's not much to look at. I hope we, we can, can take, take it on, on once, once this is all settled. The Tower Room is the thing for me. Looking out over the countryside like a real baron. <laughs> Ready to dispense justice or go riding on a noble steed? You won't mind, will you, Mother? Empty as the building is, we can put any sort of room you might want anywhere else. What? What, what is it? What the devil are you doing, you damn fool? What is And behind the arras? A damp ancient wall of stone, patched here and there by the restorers, and devoid of any trace of rodent prowlers. After a time, Blackie returned wearily to his place across my feet, I had not moved, but I did not sleep again that night. Uh, good morning, ma'am. <gasps> you left word to wake you at... <gasps> Goodness! Whatever happened here? What? Uh, oh, that... Of came loose, gave me a bit of a fright when it went down. Perhaps Mr. Stott will know how to put it back up again. Perhaps. So you all didn't hear anything odd last night? Mum? Oh, did you call? I'm ever so sorry, but we shouldn't have heard anything from servants' quarters, Mum. You might look to having a bell put in. I don't mean this. I meant anything. I... I think my cat was startled by thunder or something, and he... Oh, that sort of odd. No, can't say as I heard anything, ma'am. Funny you should mention the cat, though. Cook said one of the other cats woke her with yowling in the wee hours. She was that mad she was. But no idea what caused it. Oh, not a bit. Said cat raced off toward the stairs to the basement, but she, well, cook, I mean, didn't feel much like chasing, seeing as she had a full day of work ahead of her. Cats have their own minds. Hmm, funny business. Did you have any idea what might have set him off? I... I think so. If I may say, Mum, you, you don't sound very certain. It may be my imagination. It has been a very long, tiring... I heard rats. Rats? In the Priory? In the walls of my room. In the tower. But those walls are stone, quite solid. Don't you think I know that? I suppose it's not impossible that there might be passages worn deep inside the walls, 
They are very thick. But by the sound of it, there were so many. You know about the rats, don't you? What? The Exum Priory rats. Oh, Alfred mentioned something about a story, but I haven't pursued it. So many other tales seemed more pertinent to my forebears. Oh, goodness, Mum, I, I never realised. May I? Go on. This is, of course, local law, and there haven't been any sort of rodents in the place, not that anyone has seen, for centuries. So I've got ghost rats. I must say I'm quite disappointed. If anything was to walk these ancestral halls, I expected a baron at least. <laughs> no, these rats were all too solid. A scampering army of obscene vermin that burst forth from the castle three months after the family was murdered. A lean, filthy, ravenous army, sweeping all before it, devouring fowl, cats, dogs, hogs, sheep, and even two hapless human beings before its fury was spent. They scattered among the village homes and brought curses and horrors in their wake. But where did these rats come from? At the Priory. And no one ever noticed them before that? You think my ancestors were involved in some sort of rat breeding escapade? Perhaps they were engaged in a lucrative rat fur trade. <laughs> well, when you put it that way... And why the devil would they be in my walls? Perhaps you dreamed them. When I didn't even know about the story? Ah, point taken. Norris lent me some traps in Paris Green, which I had the servants place in strategic localities when I returned home. I retired early, being very sleepy, but was harassed by dreams of the most horrible sort. I was gazing upon a dim landscape and a flock of fungus, flabby beasts, like large, pale pigs, but somehow wrong in their physiognomy. Their very appearance filled me with unutterable loathing, as the no less loathsome swineherd dozed over his charge, a mighty swarm of rats rained down on the stinking abyss and fell to devouring beasts and man alike. Something. Nothing? Not even droppings, and that many rats would have certainly. <gasps> the trap! Um, should be able to. Uh, and there! <clears throat> Not a one! Good God! Either I'm haunted or mad. As I refuse to be mad. I choose haunted. Shall we go and see what your brothers are up to? That looks promising. I became suddenly aware of sounds in the great room below. Sounds of a nature which could not be mistaken. The oak-paneled walls were alive with rats. Not vanishing this time, eh? Shh, shh. I think... I think I can tell where they're going. These creatures, in numbers apparently inexhaustible, were engaged in one stupendous migration from inconceivable heights to some depth conceivably, or inconceivably, below. Mum, what's wrong with the cats? Shush, girl. Mum. May we assist you in any way? You don't hear it. The cats? Yes, of course. They're putting quite a fuss all over the place. And... And no idea what's causing it? None, Mum. Several have congregated at the door to the subcellar. Perhaps it is an... odour. But by the time we got there, the cats had already dispersed. I resolved to explore the crypt below, 
but for the present I merely made a round of all the traps. All were sprung, yet all were tenantless. Mum, I... Oh, I'm so sorry, Mum. Nonsense. I should be awake. Won't sleep well tonight, else. Captain Norris is here. Are you accepting callers? Oh, goodness gracious, I sent for the boy. Send him on in. Yes, Mum. You needed something? Would you care to accompany me into the sub-cellar again, young man? Been taken under the wing, a touch of flyer humor, of local squire-to-be Captain Edward Norris. Showing me the ropes. Decent fellow, I mean, chap, and completely reliable. People keep mistaking us for brothers. At least, until I open my big American mouth. P. Gete, Prop Temp Dona. What the devil are you looking at there? The, the inscriptions. El Prec versus Pontifi Attis. Which means? Not a clue, I fear, but I know who would. Huh. Before we call on your vaunted Sir William, I propose an experiment. Oh? I say we bring down a couple of chairs and spend the night down here. Listening for... anything. Here? Among the altars? The cats seem to think it is the place to be. Who am I to argue? The reference to Attis made me shiver, for I had read Catullus and knew something of the hideous rites of the Eastern God, whose worship was so mixed with that of Sibylle. The Great Mother required her priests to give up their very manhood, and yet the Romans felt that this upstart local cult here was somehow worse? Well... I filled the lamps and have extra oil. Have no concern on that account. I'm not concerned. Good. Will the cat be all right? Of course. It's my sub-cellar. He can relieve himself wherever he wants. Oh, I say. I don't mean to be coarse. I suppose I'm a bit more nervous than I thought. And I haven't been sleeping much. I, I mean, sleeping well. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read through Sir William's entire book yet. Uh, do you know anything about these stones? A bit. I've been here on a number of occasions when they were poking about. Some of their talk went a bit over my head. Anything you recall is more than I know. Well, this one, for instance. This pattern, this sort of rayed sun, I think they said this was clearly of non-Roman origin, which suggests that these altars were merely adopted by the Roman priests from some older temple on the same side. And the brown stains on this one? I assume these are not merely rust? No, not rust. Cheerful. May... may I ask a bit of a personal question, Mum? You can ask. I can always decide not to answer. Why... why did you come here? How else am I supposed to figure out what's going on in this house of mine? No, no, sorry. I mean, why come to Anchester at all? Oh. Never mind. It, it was impertinent. I'm, I'm so sorry. Hush, it's perfectly reasonable. But it isn't a simple question to answer. Al Alfred had his heart set on this place, on living here. And I've nothing else. But surely you have friends and family. My family is dead. And friends. Huh. At my age, they're all nattering on about weddings and funerals and grandchildren. And I've got this beast. Of course, I'm also in mourning, so I've no one to speak to at all. And my housekeeper runs the house, and the business went to my husband's partner when he passed. So my choices were limited. Wear respectable black and sit on my hands for a year. In the house where my boy suffered so much, until merciful death released him. Or leave the country. I've put everything into this place, my time, my hopes, rather like a memorial, 
and I will not let some figment of spectral law take it away from me. I have lost too much already. As we sat there expectantly, I found my vigil occasionally mixed with half-formed dreams, horribly like the one I had had the night before. I saw again the swineherd with his unmentionable fungus beasts wallowing in filth, and as I looked at these things they seemed nearer and more distinct, so distinct that I could almost observe their features. Then I did observe the flabby features of one of the things. <laughs> uh, I say, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to laugh, only I was trying to decide if I should wake you, Mum. You seemed rather disturbed. Norris might have laughed more, or perhaps less, had he known what it was that made me scream. But I did not remember myself till later. Ultimate horror often paralyzes memory in a merciful way. Shh! Listen! The cats! They're all outside the door, and look at your fellow there! The cats, you say? Nothing more? No. Am I missing something? An acute terror now rose within me, for here were anomalies which nothing normal could well explain. These rats, if not the creatures of a madness which I shared with the cats alone, must be burrowing and sliding in Roman walls I had thought to be of solid limestone blocks. And, if these were living vermin, why did not Norris hear their disgust and commotion? I hear rats. Where? Everywhere. I can hear them. The cats can too. Why can't you? I... I wish I had an answer. Are you quite sure? Do you hear anything else I might be mistaking for rats? Anything at all? Do you think I would concoct such a fool idea? No, of, of course. Where are they then? O over there near you? They were everywhere, but now they're fading. Not like a dream, but like they've moved on. Downward. Downward? But we're at the lowest point of the subcellars. There's nothing at all below us but the solid cliff. I'm not mad, you know. I would never think it. I've been quite steeped in these legends, and I put nothing past this place. If you are haunted by rats, then I shall do whatever I can to help you. Where are they now? Gone. But they were definitely moving downward. The cats must agree. They've, they've dispersed. The others may have given up, but not my blackie. Look at him. Yes. He seems to be fascinated with that central altar. I don't know what you want me to do. That's the noise he uses when he chases his ball under a chair and can't get at it. I'll take a closer look. What? What is it? I don't see anything. If there's any hole a rat could get into, I'm not finding... Oh, I say... It was only this, that the flame of the lantern set down near the altar was slightly but certainly flickering from a draught of air which it had not before received, and which came indubitably from the crevice between floor and altar. We spent the rest of the night in the brilliantly lighted study, nervously discussing what we should do next. The idea that some vault deeper than the deepest known masonry of the Romans might underlay this accursed pile, unsuspected by the curious antiquarians, would have been sufficient to excite us without any background of the sinister. By morning, we had decided to make a trip to London to gather a group of archaeologists and scientific men fit to cope with the mystery. Before leaving the subcellar, we had vainly tried to move the central altar which we now recognized as the gate to a new pit of nameless fear. What secret would open that gate? Wiser heads than I would have to find. Not a good day. Bit of trouble sleeping. Stress, I expect. Waiting. Keep waking with strange echoes in my head but never able to hold on to them. 
One good thing about military life, always something to take your mind off your woes. I think I dreamed of a cave, but when I mentioned it to a fellow, he went on and on about Freud and said utterly disgusting things, which I refuse to repeat. Except to let you know, mother, that if anyone ever offers to talk Freud at you, you should immediately show them the door. As I drifted into sleep, I expected to see that same grotto, those flabby beasts. But while I knew they were nearby with that dread certainty of the unseen that dreams impart, I was not outside with them. It was a feast in the most decadent Roman style. Unspeakable things were going on all around me, but again for no reason but simple certainty. I knew I was an honored guest. Have whatever you want. What? The feast. What would you like? Here's the main course. Uh, oh, Alfred, is that the bell? Where the devil is that nurse? Alfred? Oh. Oh. Oh, of course. Uh. Here you go, ma'am. The one bag should suffice. We don't expect to be gone for over long. Sooner started, sooner done. Go ahead and put it in the motor car. Mum, may I please speak to you? When I return from London. No, please. It has to be now. What is it? Only, ma'am, I find I have to give my notice. And I thought as you were going to London, this would be a good time for you to find other help. You're leaving my employ? Why? My... My mother is ill, ma'am. Really? Well, I... She... Oh, mum, is this place... I cannot stick it here another day. Why ever not? I've been more than generous. No, but mum, it's the cats. And the way they run about at night. And the people in town, the things they say. They say the house is cursed. And that any de la poor must be cursed as well. And anyone what serves them. Nonsense. Have you heard about Lady Mary? What? Well, they say that hundreds of years back, Lady Mary Delapour, as young and lovely a woman as ever walked this earth, was sent in marriage to the Earl of Shrewsfield. He was very much in love with her. Well, that's hardly any reason. And yet three days after their wedding night, he murdered her with the help of his own mother. They cut her heart from her body. And the priest they confessed to, he absolved them. And why would he do that? No one knows. Priests never tell. And the Earl never allowed his wife's name to be mentioned in his presence. And he never touched another woman, not ever again. That's all very thrilling, but what the devil do you expect me to do about the housework? Clean the place my own damn self? Get down on my old knees to scrub? Don't. Uh, Just go. But but don't expect a letter of reference. Oh, no. There's the true rats of Exum. But I am no sinking ship. Feeling quite serious today, Mother. Made a visit to the local hospital with the fellows who've been mustered out. It's horrible. Makes me realize all too well why stories of ghosts and monsters are dying out in this modern age. We have far worse things to frighten our children with. And if you plan to tell me I'm a crazy old woman, you'd best get it over with so I don't waste any more of my time. Oh, I say. Do you feel as if you were mad? Please, Dr. Trask. My good lady, in a house such as Exum Priory, one would have to be mad to not have some concern. Women are often most sensitive to the presence of outer beings. Poppycock. Three times now I've heard noises that no one else could hear. Save for the cats. I meant people. And much as I'm fond of my felines, I have not yet reached such a stage of senility that I dress them and expect them to respond when I talk. No human ears have heard. Though the only one I have confided in about these sounds is Captain Norris here. He was present on the most recent occasion. A haunting by rats? Most unprecedented. 
From my correspondence, I have reports of any number of ghost dogs, a few horses, and several cats. But that, that would be my assistant Ludlow. I sent him to fetch Professor Carnaby. The professor is an expert in ancient religions. Don't let him put you off. Is it is it terrible if I say, in strictest confidence, just between you and me and the censor, Mother, that I am beginning to lose my faith in experts? They talk a lot about what war is like, but you can tell they've never been out there. They say research shows and by all accounts phrases that make their information dodgy at best. And yet, who am I to speak? I have yet to fly my first real mission. I promise I'll make you. And any forebears who might be watching, proud. The cult of the Magna Mater was one of the mystery cults so popular in ancient Greece, though its origins stretch at least as far as Anatolia. Cybele is called the Great Mother and associated with Rhea, the Titan that gave birth to the Greco-Roman pantheon. But Sibylle's function in legendary is ultimately more that of a wife than mother. In that way, she mirrors the myth cycles of Inanna and Isis in her association with the dying and reborn god. The rebirth myth usually took the form of a ritual descent into the deepest recesses of the underworld to seek out the deceased and bring him back up into the light of the living. Generally accepted as a primitive explanation for the change of seasons, in each of these, the goddess's primary position in the story cycle was as helpmeet to the god's resurrection. From the little reading I've done, I always had the impression that the god in these cycles was subordinate to the goddess. Nonsense. The dying and returning god. An obvious reflection of the eventual advent of the Christian Savior is clearly the superior. But he's the one that dies and is resurrected. Never forget. Now, now, Carnaby. I'm sure Mrs. Delapore meant no challenge to your authority. Don't you encourage curiosity in your students? When I taught, classes were more. Civilized, all just fellows. Ah, Carnaby, may I see you for a minute in my study? <sighs> Judging from his liver spots, when he taught, they were probably still publishing books by hand. Mrs. Delapore, Madam, a lack. I, I I see you standing at the brink. Oh, don't bother. I've never been one for any of this spiritual hooey. You may not believe in the spirits, Madam, but they believe in you. And they suggest that you should, nay, you must remain above and let the experts handle any deep investigation. Nonsense! And if you suggest any such thing again, I'll invite you and your spirits to take a walk off a pier. A spirit is speaking to me, calling out to you in anguish. His name is, yes, Nain. <coughs> I think. <coughs> He's concerned for your soul. Are you all right, Mum? I'm fine. Would you please summon a car for me? I think my time will be best spent making arrangements for supplies. I'll come along. Nonsense. If they feel they need anything, the living ones anyway, send a list ahead or order it. There's a good fellow. I will be perfectly fine on my own. How could that feather-headed psychic know that my Alfred? My miracle baby, my only, born long after I'd given up all hope. How could he know that when he was tiny, I nicknamed him Nain after one of Jesus's miracles? You know very well, Sir William, that there are myths behind the myths, older stories still, hmm. like the rut beneath the surface of a seemingly placid bog. The links between this locale and the antediluvian cult. That is precisely why we must see what went on down there. Why you must come. You're the only one likely to understand the significance. Should any reference to uh, to the book come to light? There has never been a connection between this particular site and the next. 
Nomicon. Then we can certify it clear and move on. And that harridan? You <laughs> must be gracious. Like it or not, if you put her off, she may forbid any investigation. Bad tempered women. I can't stand them. Bad tempered men, on the other hand. <laughs> I don't know why I ever left you, Mother. It seemed like such a noble cause, such a chance to do good. And a bit like running away with the circus. And yet, it seems I've come so far just to see how very dark the world can truly be. How could I have ever thought of war as a lark? You were absolutely right in forbidding me to risk it. And once I make it back, I promise I will spend the rest of my life making up for my mistake. If I make it back. All was now ready. And at 11 a.m. our entire group, bearing powerful electric searchlights and implements of excavation, went down to the subcellar and bolted the door behind us. Blackie was with us, for the investigators found no occasion to despise his excitability and were indeed anxious that he be present in case of obscure rodent manifestations. Much good a lone cat could do against a horde of rats, ghostly or otherwise, but I took heart in his company. We noted the Roman inscriptions and unknown altar designs only briefly, for three of the savants had already seen them, and all knew their characteristics. Prime attention was paid to the momentous central altar, and within an hour, Sir William Brinton had caused it to tilt backward, balanced by some unknown species of counterweight. Bones! Oh, good God! Avert your eyes, madam. I've seen bones before. Let me through. This is my area. Hmm. Fascinating. Oh, the woe. So many... Deaths. It does not require an expert to divine no. I say, let me have a look at him. This is amazing. Sealed as this passage has been for 300 years, this is a perfect time capsule. Looks as though an entire town died down there. Yes. Well, we shall have to leave them be. It is imperative to preserve this intact for proper study. And how do you propose getting past it? The bones cover the stairs, and we don't know how deep they go. Do you expect to fly? No, madam. I expect to have some assistance brought so we can carefully clear these out and make proper classification. Too many archaeologists are apt to toss such critical evidence about higgledy-piggledy as unimportant in their search for gold and other more obvious valuables. This is my house, and I want to see what's down those stairs. No. No, you mustn't. I feel a presence. A terror beyond anything you've ever known. I've had just about enough out of you. The next person tries to stop me, order me around, or frighten me, and I shall call a halt to this entire enterprise. I can have a cement mixer here in an hour to seal everything up, and no one will get to see a damn thing. Madam! You understand? How dare you? This could be... Silence! My apologies to our gracious hostess and to my esteemed colleagues, but bickering like children will get us nowhere. Ludlow? Lantern. Sir? Hmm. I see. Right. Trask... I'm afraid I shall have to override you. Those stairs will have to be cleared so we may proceed downward. But... But... You may quickly select an area for us to carefully avoid disturbing so you may examine the specimens at your leisure. Ludlow, you have tapes and stakes? Of course, sir. After plowing down a few steps amidst the gnawed bones, we saw that there was light ahead. Not Hoffman or Heisman's could conceive a scene more wildly incredible, more frenetically repellent, or more gothically grotesque than the tenebrous world into which we staggered. What we saw was no mystic phosphorescence, but a filtered daylight which must come from unknown fissures in the cliff. 
That such fissures had escaped notice from outside was hardly remarkable, for not only is the valley wholly uninhabited, but the cliff is such that only an aeronaut could study its face in detail. A few steps more, and our breaths were literally snatched from us by what we saw, so literally that Thornton fainted again into the arms of the dazed man who stood behind him. <sighs> Norris, his plump face utterly white and flabby, simply cried out inarticulately, whilst I think that what I did was to gasp or hiss and cover my eyes. Carnaby, the only one of the party older than I, croaked the hackneyed My God in the most cracked voice I ever heard. Only Sir William Brinton retained his composure, a thing more to his credit because he led the party and must have seen the sight first. What do I do with this psychic? It was a twilight grotto of enormous height, stretching away farther than any eye could see. A subterraneous world of limitless mystery and horrible suggestion. There were buildings and other architectural remains. In one terrified glance, I saw a weird pattern of cumuli, a savage circle of monoliths, a low-domed Roman ruin, a sprawling Saxon pile, and an early English edifice of wood. But all these were dwarfed by the ghoulish spectacle presented by the general surface of the ground. For yards about the steps extended an insane tangle of human bones, or bones at least as human as those on the steps. Like a foamy sea they stretched, some fallen apart, but others wholly or partly articulated as skeletons, either fighting off some mm, mm, menace or clutching other forms with <coughs> cannibal intent. Ludlow, clear an area and set those packs down. We'll designate this base camp. From the angle and the time, I calculate we get the best light here. Very good, sir. Before Trask accuses us of treasure hunting again, let's get some photographic records of precisely what we found. Ludlow, you know what to do. Light's a bit dodgy for the equipment, sir. Uh, but you know I'll manage. Good man. Start with that building on the left. Uh, outside, inside, three shots each. You bought plenty of plates? More up above as well, sir. So we are to stand here and look decorative while you play with your toys? Nonsense. Soon as we get good shots of each house, we can take a closer look. But we have to tread lightly. No telling what might come crashing down the instant it's touched. Oh. What about back there, past the buildings? Archaeology is 99% patience, madam. And war is hell. Sir William, this is marvelous. Yes? The skull. Look, do you see it? Hmm. Humanoid skull. But of a very low order. And? Tooth marks. Rats, I should say. No, no, no. Don't you see? Perhaps you could enlighten those of us who haven't made a study of such things. It is normally human. But look at the placement of the eyes and the extension of the spine. This is the skull of something that humanity's cousin as it may be. What on all fours? I say. <sighs> is there something wrong with that fellow? I wonder that any man among us lived and kept his sanity through that hideous day of discovery. Stumbling on revelation after revelation, and trying to keep for the nonce from thinking of the events which must have taken place there three hundred years, or a thousand, or two thousand, or ten thousand years ago. Horror piled on horror as we began to interpret the architectural remains. The quadruped things, with their occasional recruits from the biped class, had been kept in stone pens, out of which they must have broken in their last delirium of hunger or rat fear. Sir William, standing with his searchlight in the Roman ruin, translated aloud the most shocking ritual I have ever heard. Is it safe? Please. Please. 
Stay outside for the moment, Mum. I'm tired of standing about. It certainly seems sturdy enough. No, it's not that. It's... There's nothing in there to see. Nothing you would want to see. You know I won't take that as an answer. It was a butcher shop, but the cut remains were... Oh, God. Oh, I see. And this was my family. It wasn't even the remains that were the worst. It was... There were notes jotted on the wall. Recipes. I... I... If you'll excuse me. Poor damn fool boy. Quite amazing, isn't it all? What was inside there? Well, I don't know. Nora said it looked safe enough, but then he saw something he felt the need to run off and look at. Perhaps you should go inside. Mrs. Delaport, if you'd like to have a look. Oh, so sorry. I'm being summoned. <laughs> we regret to inform you that your son, Lieutenant Alfred Delaport, has been injured in combat. As his injuries will require long-term care, the army will be releasing him from active duty. Postscript, if I may offer a piece of advice from me to you, due to the extensive nature of your son's injuries, may I suggest that a residence hospital be found, rather than trying to bring him back over and care for him in your home. Please accept my deepest sympathies. You said you wanted to see what your distant ancestors were getting up to. This seems as good an example as any. Ludlow has been in and made sure nothing would come down on you. I'm sure I appreciate your concern. Just a moment. This is not pretty. And there is a world of difference between hearing about a monstrous horror and seeing it firsthand. Sir William, everything here is old news. Doesn't even smell of death anymore. Until you can point me at something that is still crying out in agony, with the gangrenous flesh rotting right off its bones and the smell of decay filling the entire house so that everything you ever eat is tainted with the taste of rot, I doubt you can even turn my stomach. Within, I found a terrible row of ten stone cells with rusty bars. Three had tenants, all skeletons of the high grade, and on the bony forefinger of one I found a seal ring with the family's coat of arms. Sir William found a vault with far older cells below the Roman chapel, but these cells were empty. Below them was a low crypt with cases of formally arranged bones, some of them bearing terrible parallel inscriptions carved in Latin, Greek, and the tongue of Phrygia. Meanwhile, I had opened one of the prehistoric tumuli and brought to light skulls which were slightly more human than a gorilla's and which bore indescribable ideographic carvings. Through all this horror, my cat stalked unperturbed. Once I saw him monstrously perched atop a mountain of bones, and wondered at the secrets that might lie behind his yellow eyes. We shall never know what sightless Stygian world yawned beyond the little distance we went, for it was decided that such secrets are not good for mankind. What the devil? That building must have been unstable. Who was in there? Mrs. Delapore? Not I. It was Dr. Tresk, Sir William. He didn't want to wait, sir. Consider, we were looking for a reason to shut this place back up and bar bystanders. True. <coughs> right in the nick of time. Dr. Trask, are you all right? <coughs> Wouldn't be if not for this lad's quick thinking. <coughs> Just a bit of training, watching out... Never know when something will sneak up on you. Surprise is the best weapon an enemy, or indeed, a house can have. Stay close now, and out of any of these structures. No telling what might have jarred loose. There was plenty to engross us close at hand, 
for we had not gone far before the searchlights showed that accursed infinity of pits in which the rats had feasted, and whose sudden lack of replenishment had driven the ravenous rodent army first to turn on the living herds of starving things, and then to burst forth from the priory in that historic orgy of devastation which the peasants will never forget. God, those carrion black pits of sword, picked bones, and open s- skulls. Those nightmare chasms choked with the pithecanthropoid, Celtic, Roman, and English bones of countless unhallowed centuries. Some of them were full, and none can say how deep they had once been. Others were still bottomless to our searchlights, and peopled by unnameable fancies. What I thought of the hapless rats that stumbled into such traps amidst the blackness of their quests in this grisly Tartarus. I must be very deliberate now and choose my words. Then there came a sound from that inky, boundless, farther distance that I thought I knew, and I saw my old black cat dart past me like a winged Egyptian god straight into the illimitable gulf of the unknown. But I was not far behind. Show me! I'll follow you! I'm coming! It was the eldritch scurrying of those fiend-born rats, always questing for new horrors and determined to lead me on even under those grinning caverns of Earth's center where Azatoth, the mad faceless god, howls blindly to the piping of two amorphous idiot flute players. There are myths behind the myths. Older stories still. Once my foot slipped near a horribly yawning brink and I had a moment of ecstatic fear not knowing if I would go over. I'm not sure I would stop myself if I could. Everything is right. You hang in the air and time stands still. I must have been musing a long time, for I could not see any of the party but the plump Captain Norris. Making up for the deprivations of wartime, I expect. My searchlight expired, and yet I still ran. I heard voices and yowls and echoes, but above all, there gently rose that impious, insidious scurrying, gently rising, rising as a stiff, bloated corpse gently rises above an oily river that flows under endless onyx bridges to a black, putrid sea. A lean, filthy, ravenous army. Something bumped into me, something soft and plump. It must have been the rats. The viscous, gelatinous, ravenous army that feast on the dead and the living. And brought curses and horrors in their wake. Why shouldn't rats eat a delapore as a delapore eats forbidden things? The war ate my boy, damn them all. And the Yanks ate Carfax with flames and burnt grandsire delapore in the secret? No. No, I tell you. My son is not that demon swineherd in the Twilight Grotto. It was not Edward Norris's fat face on that flabby fungus thing. Who says I am a Delapore? He lived, but my boy died. <gasps> Shall a Norris hold the lands of a Delapore? It's voodoo, I tell you. That spotted snake. I see you standing at the brink. Curse you, Thornton. I'll teach you to faint at what my family do. Someone more dark would Alice Splod thou stinkard. I'll learn you how to gust. Would ya swink a myth, Magna Mater! Magna Mater! Gadus! Mom? Mom? Jia up you with up to the Nagus bath do not orst. Jonash, Jolish orst. That is what they say I said when they found me in the blackness after three hours. Found me crouching in the blackness over the plump, half-eaten body of Captain Norris, 
with my own cat leaping and tearing at my throat. Now they've blown up Exum Priory and taken my, my dear Blackie away from me and shut me into this barred room at Hanwell with fearful whispers about my heredity and experiences. Thornton is here too, but they prevent me from talking to him. They are trying as well to suppress most of the facts concerning the Priory. When I speak of poor Norris, they accuse me of a hideous thing. But they must know that I did not do it. They must know it was the rats. The slithering, scurrying rats whose scampering will never let me sleep. The demon rats that race behind the padding in this room and beckon me down to greater horrors than I have ever known. The rats they can never hear. The rats! The rats in the walls. Tonight's episode, The Rats in the Walls, was adapted by Julie Hoverson from the story by H.P. Lovecraft. Mrs. Delapore was Julie Hoverson. Captain Edward Norris was Will Watt. Sir William Brinton was John Lingard. Alfred Delapore was Danner Hoverson. Renaud LaBeouf played Blackie. The tea ladies were Eugenie, Jennifer Dixon, and Laura, Judith Moore. Millie the Maid was Fiona Thrale. Mr. Stott was Alex Gilmore. Among the experts, Dr. Trask was Robert Cudmore. Thornton, the psychic investigator, was Michael Hudson. Professor Carnaby was Shane McGovern. And the assistant Ludlow was Gareth Bowley. The letter from the army was Felbrig Harriet of the Cthulhu podcast. The locals were Nat Dixon, Greg McLaughlin, Caitlin Snedden. Also heard with the children's chant and the additional cats were Beverly Poole, Mike Campbell, and Kimberly Poole. Much thanks to Hero, Lothar Tuppen, Steve Guy, Elizabeth Flett, Robert Cudmore for much help. Music for this episode was from the repertoire of The Footage Firm. Cover art was by Julie Hoverson. Sound and mastering was done by Julie Hoverson. Sound effects were found on soundsnap.com, sonomic.com, stockmusic.com, onesoundfx.com, and also through the footage firm and Blastwave FX. All persons, places, and events in this story were fictitious or used in a fictitious manner and are not meant to reflect any persons, places, or things, living, dead, or undead. Questions? Comments? We would love to hear from you. Contact us at 19nocturnatlive.com, that's 19nocturne, or check out our website at www.19nocturneboulevard.com. Also, you can like us on Facebook. This presentation, as well as the scripts and characters therein, is copyright 2012 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions, and is released under a Creative Commons 3.0 Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Spread the show around, but don't try to make money off it. If you want to try something, like to reenact an episode, just drop us a line. Divins. But you never flew it. Do you want to swap? Do you want to come into your line? We'll come. Not rust. It's blood, mate, in it. Uh, don't quite know how to make the sound of a faint. Noise of effort. <laughs> I always do really badly at these kinds of things. I just sound constipated. Oh well. Too many archaeologists are apt to toss such crack a door. Fucking fuck. <laughs> Castle. I know it's spelt like that, but it's not pronounced like that. Uh. Ooh, it's what mysterious it is. <laughs> Ooh, it is. Bobby Cock or not, the local. Locals? Locals is not a word. Oh, it's, uh, shite. Right. I sound like Captain Janeway on board the Starship Voyager. <laughs> oh, housemate, stop thumping. Sorry.